Well, welcome back to Thriving in Business and Life. This is Will Wilkinson. And I'm Christopher Harding, and we're going to pick up where we left off as promised last time, Will. We were talking about inclusion, and one of the things that uh, we did a lot of research on when we were writing our, our book, uh, especially around this chapter, was a, a, really a topic that you don't hear talked about a lot in the uh, corporate and organizational environment, and that is what we referred to jokingly as the <laughs> L word. <laughs> right. Which brings up various possibilities. <laughs> yeah, so what we were talking about was the four-letter word love. Right, and uh, I remember when we were writing this, and I felt a little nervous about bring, bringing up that word in the business context, but you immediately clarified it with one, I think, simple but brilliant comment it matters when you love what you do well and let's take it further than that because that's an easy one that's a safe one to get by and everybody can go yeah yeah it's important that we well, love what that's we why do. i liked it <laughs> that's the low hanging fruit <laughs> so it is important that we help people find what is it about their job that they're passionate about what is it that they love and that we know people well enough uh, to really be able to dial into that. But even more importantly, we, we tapped into the work of Barbara Fred Fredrickson, a social psychologist who's done a lot of work on brain science and neurology as it relates to what happens to a person's mind and body when they feel loved and appreciated, mm -hmm. when they feel valued and respected, would yeah. be another way to, to say that in you know a business nomenclature. But what happens to people, and I think we can all relate to this, when you believe somebody gets you, mm -hmm. they really see you, yeah. they, they appreciate who you are, they, they have a real love for who you are, mm -hmm. what happens to us is our brain and our neurology and our neurochemistry all light up and we begin to fire at a higher level of intelligence and engagement and cooperation, etc., than, well, and it, than otherwise. And, and this is so much more important in the 21st century with the acceleration in, in every field because we need nimble minds. Right. We need individuals who can access their genius at a moment's notice. And what you're describing, that kind of culture that gives a person that kind of good feeling, that empowers that kind of genius. Well, it does. And that's one of the things that she, she showed was that, that literally a person functions at their higher level when they're feeling loved and appreciated. And so challenging as it is sometimes for a hard-charging manager or leader to go, what, you're telling me now I've got to love my people? Mm -hmm. Well, if you want them at their best, yes. Well, and we might even say to them, it's actually simpler than that. Because it's understandable that any of us confronted with the possibility of needing to change or learn something new and apply that could feel intimidated. Well, that's a part of this picture. But what we're really saying is, no, create a culture for that. You don't have to be the superstar with, you know, 16 new skills but simply the conscious intention, okay, I have an organization, I see the value of creating an environment where people love coming to work and where they feel appreciated, respected, and even loved. Now, I know it's not a magic wand, but having that intention begins to shift things. Well, it changes communication, it changes yeah. people's openness, it changes their sense of safety, is it okay to speak up? I mean, there's so many you know, you could say side benefits uh, yeah. that come from creating that kind of culture. As yeah, you said. And, and I'm remembering talking to clients who, you know, I've recommended this kind of thing in different settings, and they talk to me later and they kind of go, it's working. <laughs> I was really doubtful, but you know, uh, it, this is working. And what they're saying is that they didn't have to be brilliant. Having the intention, making some first simple steps, started to get results right away. Well, you know, there's, there are some simple things we can do. And you're right, it isn't a question of, of acquiring a new skill. It's, it's just it's changing the lens. We talked last time about if I put on the lens where I'm looking for people's brilliance, 
You know, that's that's what I'm looking for, and I I'm drawing that out of them. Then you know that's what they tend to give me. If I'm right. looking if I'm looking at people from the standpoint of what's great about this person, what's really mm-hmm. enjoyable, what's lovable about them, even the most sometimes difficult person we can start to see through and and because of how our mirror neuron networks work if i am really speaking to you could say that deeper more genuine caring part of them it's actually going to start to stimulate that because it's almost like they physiologically can't help it because we've our network put that out to theirs and they feel it and unless they're really going to be in strong resistance they'll start to gradually go along with that more cooperative enjoyable culture well what i've witnessed which has surprised me and thrilled me is that this principle works even with extremely difficult people and we probably all have some people in our lives like that i'm i'm thinking in this case about the really big egos full of themselves And the strategy here with inclusion that I'm referring to is how when you're faced with a person like that, the tendency is to back away. I mean, mine is. Uh, Someone else might want to compete with them, but I tend to kind of shrink back and I want them to be smaller. So I kind of get smaller. Well, a reverse strategy is to engage more with them, to include them even more. And as I mentioned to a, a consultant friend of mine this morning, to use the simplest of techniques, ask them questions. Right, right. They're going on and on about something, and inside you're going, God, when are they going to stop? But to reverse attention and say, you know, I want to show some real interest in what they're saying. I'm going to ask a couple of pointed questions. Now, I've had experiences doing that that the person just changed before my eyes. It's like they, they, this person seems interested in what I'm saying. <laughs> well, and, and interested and interested in them. Interested you know. in them, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and, and uh, you know, the ability, I mean, what sometimes happens, and some of us play this role more easily than others, is we end up facilitating a meeting or a conversation, even though that's not our role, yeah. because yeah. we're trying to actually stimulate a culture of inclusion. Yeah. Right. And uh, one of the things that uh, Barbara Fredrickson brought up in her work, and it's shown up in a variety of other sources that we've researched now, is that the converse is also true. In other words, when we exclude people, Mm -hmm. when we uh, don't respect people, when they don't feel loved and appreciated, literally they start functioning more from a survival standpoint. Uh, So it's that thing that we've referred to and many people call an amygdala hijack. Yeah, let's get into this because it's such an interesting phenomena and it taps, of course, into brain science, which we we included quite a bit of in our book. Well, so, I mean, I think we've all um, had a situation where somebody startled us or, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe genuinely you had to flee a situation or were forced into, you know, fighting for your your survival. Um, In those cases, there's part of the brain, brain scientists say it's a very ancient part of the brain, that knows how to do four things, Mm -hmm. but it knows how to do them really well. Fight, flight, freeze, or faint. Now, when you need those four things, you're really glad that that part of your brain, the amygdala, which is part of the limbic brain system, is there. Right. However, what they've realized is that that part of the brain that also is what stimulates things like adrenaline and cortisol and other you know, high-stress hormones, it, in our current world, gets triggered over things that aren't really life and death. Mm-hmm. And so one of the primary things that triggers it is the feeling of banishment or exclusion. Right. I mean, that, if you think about it, on a biological standpoint, that is one of the greatest threats, is that you're you're singled out, you're excluded, or culled off from the herd, as as they say sometimes. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, Mm -hmm. then really what we're doing when we exclude people is we are putting them into a far greater biological likelihood that they won't be functioning from a full brain standpoint. Mm So it's almost like consigning them uh, 
to the to the fate of being not a high performer because we're not allowing them or creating the conditions for them to function at their best. And what we notice is that we're all compensating creatures. When we're under tra- a traumatic load, when we're being excluded, we'll compensate and we'll develop habits to survive. I know that there's a, a virtual epidemic right now in America of adrenal exhaustion. Right. And yeah. I think part of it is because people are so uh, underappreciated and excluded and they don't feel loved that they've had to compensate. We've had to compensate with all kinds of things that end up taxing our adrenal glands. You know, gaming, uh, high stimulating activities, which just hit us. I have a friend I'm, I'm coaching right now. Her thing is being late. She's created this habit of being slightly late, not enough to really be a problem, but it's enough to stimulate her adrenal glands so she gets a bit of a charge out of it. She doesn't like it, but that's how she's compensated for some personal self-worth issues. We kind of unraveled this the other day. It was very insightful. Well, you know, there was a book written. uh, It must have been back in the 80s even. Uh, It was a bestseller for a while. It was was called How to Make Your Life Absolutely Miserable. (laughs) 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 And that was kind of a brilliant idea. And they they basically described different strategies for putting yourself under high stress, like uh, leave with just enough time so that you're not sure you're going to make the most yeah. important meeting on time. Yeah, yeah, because for some people it's riding that edge. <laughs> right. That's how they've compensated to get by, to have the excitement of that edge. Well, so knowing that people are under stress, that we're over a lot of the time, and that we are you know, having all these compensating behaviors, just from a standpoint of being wise, I guess we could say, why wouldn't I, as a leader or manager, try to create an environment where people are at their peak? Yeah, exactly. And you're reminding me of uh, some comments I heard. I uh, was at a workshop this weekend with Gene Houston, who's uh, one of America's greatest thinkers. Buckminster Fuller said her mind is a national treasure. <laughs> wow. And I was uh, emceeing an event that she was presenting at, and she was talking about... Um, Oh, some remarkable things. But but what was obvious was that her personal environment is very captivating. You get around her. You, you know, Jane, right? Yes, yes. You get around her and you feel different. And I came away realizing how powerful the inclusion of our environment is, just our, our personal attitude. So we're talking about inclusion and there's so many things we can do to be more inclusive. And it starts with how we're being. Yes. That's what I really learned from Jean. When someone was asking her a question, you could tell she was genuinely interested. She was really listening. She wasn't just going to come back with her, you know, standard response. She was thoughtful about it. And you could tell the person was feeling loved and Mm -hmm. seen by Jean. And that was before she said or did anything. It was just the way she is. You know, that's that's a great... uh What a wonderful quality to have as a person. I was reflecting on a workshop that I uh, co-facilitated recently, and we were asking people, what does it feel like when you're included? Mm -hmm. And what are some examples you have of leaders or managers who did a great job of that? And as people described it, it goes to what you were just saying about Jane Houston. People were talking about the fact that suddenly they felt better. They felt like the best version of themselves. They wanted to be yeah. the best version of themselves. Yeah. And, you know, there's, there's things that happened that uh, scientifically we're just beginning to explore that maybe relate more to the quantum uh, field yeah. than, than uh, or some kind of an intersection between quantum mechanics and biology, but that people have the ability to exude some type of a, call it an energy, an essence, a, a, an attitude, whatever we want to call it, that is in some way contagious. Now, we know since 2001 about mirror neuron networks, so we're starting right. to understand the, the mechanics of that, biologically speaking. But the ability to walk in a room and genuinely care about somebody mm-hmm. 
isn't something that takes more time. Exactly, exactly. They actually in this workshop they spoke about another force or another sense that uh, Jean and her partner at the event feel is emerging as a natural evolution in our species. It's quite interesting. Uh, the science that's behind this, it's a another sense beyond the five senses, even beyond the sixth sense, which is intuition. Some kind of awareness of this quantum field and being able to be with each other on another level. Because as that great question you, you asked, how does it feel to be uh, included? We can feel it. Right. Without words spoken or without anything done, we can feel when someone is genuinely with us, paying attention, interested, and has a good good feeling about us. Right. We've we've talked about uh, in in our book and in different conversations. We've talked about the idea of deep time. Yeah. Uh, so linear time or you know mechanistic time would be minutes, you know seconds, minutes, hours, days, etc. Whereas deep time is about the quality of the experience regardless of how long or short it is and that that quality has a lot to do with our ability to be present. Well you're right and you're reminding me of an exercise Jean took us through. Uh, we closed our eyes and she said okay stand up close your eyes make sure you got a little bit of room and take a couple of steps and approach the curtain of time. <laughs> and, you know, that may not sound impressive when I say it, but in the moment with Jean and 20 people in this room, it was a very interesting experience. She said, now draw back the curtain of time, and you're going to go into a different kind of time. We, we would call it deep time. She gave us 90 seconds, and she said, and she was putting us in a slight trance, I think. She said, right. Because she repeated herself a few times, and her voice softened. She said, you are only going to have 90 seconds, but that will be more than enough time to go all around the world. <laughs> In the 90 seconds I'll give you, you will have more than enough time. <laughs> right, so right. I relived a trip I took. I took a year off college, went around the world, mostly sailed. I traced my steps from the ship in Vancouver, BC, to Fiji, Honolulu, three months in New Zealand, ship to Australia, two months in Australia, shipped to Japan, three weeks in Japan, <laughs> shipped to Russia, across the Trans-Siberian Railway for two weeks, shipped to Germany, over to England a month, ship over to Montreal, and train back to Vancouver. That was almost a year. I went through that entire trip. I had about eight meals. I had about 12 conversations. I saw sunsets. I went to sleep in youth hostels. I hitchhiked in 90 seconds. Well, it's, 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 it's amazing. I mean, uh, and time, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we know this scientifically, that time is a mental construct. Yeah. Uh, we know that according to quantum physicists, at least, the rest of us are kind of left going, hmm, I don't know how that works, but that time is simultaneously, right. or simultaneously occurring, that it's all happening at once. Well, regardless of whether we understand something that complicated, I think we've probably all had moments where time has expanded and slowed down Absolutely. and we've had these deep experiences so part of the experience of inclusion is really being able to be present enough with people to where they realize we actually are interacting with them human to human because what happens when we're under pressure when we're stressed out when we're in a lot of the scenarios that we find ourselves in in the business setting is that we unintentionally dehumanize ourselves and others mm -hmm. we start well, to act like machines we start to treat others like machines well and we're distracted um, I used to open seminars by asking how many people were present <laughs> and people would give me this curious look. I'd say, I just put up your hand if you're here. I'd go, what? I'd say, well, no, I know your body is here, but is your mind here? Because we're so distracted. People are living these life in the fast lane kind of experiences where you sit and talk to somebody and you can sometimes see even in their eyes, they're, they're physically there, but they're not really there. So if we can provide a, an invitation for people to get present, I think for most people, the way they feel that is that everything slows down and it's not as hectic and there's a sense of spaciousness and like a rich field of just enjoyment. 
versus the staccato and the everything hitting each other in that distracted state where we're mentally somewhere other than where our body is. <laughs> right, right. I was just I'm laughing because it's a it's it's an experience I I've certainly had many times. I'm sure others have as well. But as you're talking about the richness of us of that kind of deep time experience, which is one of the th- things that it becomes available when we're truly being inclusive and present is that what we find is that the brain's ability to be creative, innovative, and solve higher level problems is actually greater under those circumstances. I I had a wonderful chance for years to spend a lot of time with a a really genius level physicist. And part of what he trained me and others in one of his specialties for scientists was teaching them how to uh, have breakthrough paradigm uh, you know, breaking ideas. Well, how do you teach that? Well, it was interesting. Very interesting. But yeah, it was. Part of it was starting to understand how your own mind works. Mm-hmm. But a really important part of it was taking moments to slow down enough mm. to where you actually got yourself into a state, you could mm-hmm. say, mm-hmm. that you had the were able to take advantage of the higher level thinking functions that mm-hmm. are, are part of our biology. Well, we wanted to talk a little bit about the impact in organizations of inclusion. And I know you've, you've been in many organizational settings doing your, your trainings. What have you seen happen when an organization learns, the key people learn how to be more inclusive, and it does begin to access the genius of the team? Can you say a little bit about some changes you've seen? Well, I, I think, as you were saying that, for some reason, the first thing that popped into my, into my mind was... Uh, actually a problem that was occurring in an organization that had really focused on inclusion. And the problem was, and everybody knows about it, is when Toyota was accused of having unintended acceleration in their vehicles. So they were a client at the time, and and part of the organization that I was working with happened to be the call response center. In other words, the people who had to take all the calls of concerned customers who just saw this article or read it in the paper and were suddenly fearful of their own car, right? Oh, man. So uh, it was really interesting to watch how the whole organization responded. Uh, first thing that happened was that the leader of Toyota stepped out immediately, apologized said, we're going to get to the bottom of this, we're going to take care of this, etc. Well, right there you've got something extraordinary. Yeah. That doesn't always happen. <laughs> right, and that, that came about as a result of a, of a huddle they had with some of their top people who really considered, you know, first of all, what was it that was within the ethical uh, framework, you could say, of them as a company. Mm-hmm. And they, they stayed consistent with that when it, it could have been denial and so on. Mm-hmm. Now, here's the interesting thing. The truth of the matter is that the two most publicized cases of so-called unintended acceleration weren't legitimate. They proved not to be legitimate. They proved not to be legitimate. Toyota never brought that up. Really? Yeah. They never Interesting. They never called, you know, it, it into thing. What they did was is they jumped in and took it as an opportunity to listen to their customers. Yeah. When we were working with the call centers, the call centers people, you know, we did a special training on really listening and reflective listening and hearing people and you know expressing wow I really appreciate you calling and and I'm so sorry you're concerned about this we're on top of this uh, we believe it, it was isolated incidents but we're going to keep you posted if you have further concerns please call us I mean so they mm-hmm. treated mm-hmm. their customers mm-hmm. with love and respect they listened to their concerns uh, you know as genuine concerns even though they fairly quickly realized that the two most publicized cases were not legitimate. Well, this is extraordinary, Chris, because usually, and I say more than usually, almost always, the strategy is defensive, isn't it? Pushing back and disproving? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, I I think it's one thing to have a strategy to quickly uh, own it and apologize. I think uh, Tylenol... uh, 
incident way yeah. back when was probably when the CEO of, I think it was Johnson and Johnson Products or whatever, who owned Tylenol, was the one who stood up and they immediately owned mm -hmm. the fact that they had some tainted product, even mm -hmm. though, again, the product was not tainted right. internally. Right, exactly. Right? But, but they took responsibility for it. That's they took the point. Yeah, they took responsibility, but that willingness to show genuine concern, to, ha to be more focused on the concern about, you know, in this case, the customer. So as a manager, let's, let's take that Well, can to I just heart. ask you, though, yeah. with Toyota, because you were there, how did that turn out? What was the result? Well, Toyota returned to being, you know, if not number one, number two in... in international car sales uh, so it didn't hurt them in a serious way it it hurt them temporarily mm -hmm. but not in the long term mm -hmm. um and you know i i think what it it did for a lot of manufacturers was they started to look at the fact that a lot of people had this same potential issue that mm -hmm. was going on but what i think was even as interesting as what the reaction was to the customer Mm -hmm. was how it impacted them internally. Yeah, well, if they felt listened to, heard, and respected, wow. Yeah, yeah. That builds so, engagement and being even more of a stakeholder. Well, and they realized that their call centers who were receiving all these calls needed some special attention because mm -hmm. these they were being barraged by yeah. frightened people. Yeah. Yeah, understandably. So their ability to kind of triage each other yeah. became an important part of that, that process. You know, you're reminding me of uh, the phenomena with medical doctors. I've read that medical doctors who have a good bedside manner, as it's called, who really engage with their patients, get sued less. Oh, dramatically less. Now say a bit more about that because I think it's speaking to the same thing. In this case, patients who feel seen and included and heard are going to be more friendly towards their physician even if a mistake gets made. Well, exactly. And, and I mean, it, d depending on which study you read, I mean, the if you look at it conversely, the doctors who aren't don't humanize their patients who don't treat them with respect and love and genuine concern are almost like 10 times as likely mm -hmm. to be sued mm -hmm. for the same infraction or same mistake you could say as one who genuinely has formed a, a real authentic relationship with their patient i mean it's self-evident this should be so obvious why do otherwise intelligent professionals miss this well there was a you know it goes back quite a ways and, and if you go back and study economics and we won't have to get into all the details of it but there was an economic theory uh, in you could say in manufacturing that we have to treat people as if they're not going to get things done unless we hold a stick over their head and right. so that, that that attitude has that, kind of prevailed. That right? attitude has continued to, to, to go on in the business schools. So really, it may seem intuitive when you think about it, but what we're doing is we're, we are going through a paradigm-breaking process when we start to say inclusion is actually the way to get the best results. This is feeling a little bit like a chapter in a novel where we're going to leave our listeners hanging on the edge because <laughs> definitely we need to pick this up and carry on next week. We're, we're out of time. All right. Well, you can write us at thrivinginbusinessandlife at gmail.com. I'm Christopher Harding. And I'm Will Wilkinson. We really appreciate you listening in. We'll talk to you again next week. <laughs>